group, which is part of the School of Economics here at the University of Johannesburg. And um, so this is a research group which aims at um, encouraging research among staff members as well as uh, our postgraduate students. And uh, we normally have participants uh, throughout from, uh, they come from South Africa, the rest of the continent and uh, uh, the rest of the world. The same applies to presenters. Now, uh, perhaps I should briefly just give you something about uh, the School of Economics. I must say uh, the School of Economics is one of the largest uh, in South Africa. And uh, we are a diverse school in here. terms of staff complements. We have uh, colleagues from uh, all over the world. Uh, basically, we are like a mini United Nations. So, and we offer degrees, basically the bachelor's degrees in economics and econometrics. We offer honors degree in economics and econometrics. And we also offer, I think it's one of the unique features of the, the School of Economics, where we offer specialized degrees. These specialized degrees include these specialized master's degrees include master of financial engineering, master of development economics, the master's degree in local economic development, master's degree in um, industrial policy, the other one in economics, of course, and uh, another one on uh, uh, competition regulation, competition and re regulation and economic development. And we also, of course, offer a degree of the highest order, which is a PhD in economics. And uh, there are also other specializations such as innovation and development, and then industrial policy. And uh, in terms of, um, uh, I must say that uh, we have several research centers. Uh, uh, these are public and environmental economic research center, which is focusing mainly on environmental economics. And we also have um, the Center for Local Economic Development, which is focusing on local economic development issues. And then, of course, the Center for Competition, Regulation and Economic Development. Now, these research centers, they serve as a link between the School of Economics and the industry in South Africa and globally to ensure that the research and the teaching that we do are relevant to the industry. And then uh, I must say that uh, uh, we conduct research for local, basically gov private sector and uh, government organizations. And uh, we do this within South Africa, the continent and the rest of the world. And um, our staff members uh, publish in, uh, uh, respected journals, and uh, that is mainly briefly about the School of Economics. I think one thing that I have to add is that uh, our staff members advise at uh, national, regional, and continental organizations. So that is actually what briefly about the School of Economics. And what you are going to see today is one of the activities which is organized basically by the School of Economics. And uh, we are happy today to have a scholar of note who is going to deliver a presentation. And uh, perhaps uh, maybe I should just introduce the presenter to you. We are really happy to have Professor Elizabeth Asiedu, who is a professor of economics at Howard University. She is the president and the founder of the Association for the Advancement of African Women Economists. We call it AWE, sounds South African. And her research focus on issues related to gender, foreign direct investment, foreign aid, and her work has gained international and national prominence. And she has received several teaching, mentoring, and research awards. Among others, the Woman of Distinction, and Emerging Scholars Award. That is just, uh, I just mentioned one of them. And she is ranked, just, just listen to this. She ranks in the 40th percentile in the list of 100,000 world scientists. And in terms of qualification, she holds a PhD in economics, master of science in economics, and a master of science in mathematics from the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign and 
the BSE honors in mathematics and computer science from an African university that we call the University of Ghana. Now, uh, one of the things that uh, when you ask her about her biography, there is one thing that she normally does not mention. She published among her publication, I'm talking about Blue Ribbon Journal, among others, the American Economic Review. I just mentioned that one, American Economic Review or AER. So now what she is going to present today is uh, on the impact of income per capita on health outcome, whether Africa is different. So Professor Aziedu, we are all looking forward to your presentation and over to you. Or oh, before I, I say over to her, uh, normally, uh, uh, unless if there is really a burning question, we try to give the presenter an opportunity to present and then we ask questions at the end. But if there is a burning question that you really need, that's when you can intervene. And I think, uh, yes, what we normally do within 40, within 40 minutes, the presentation, and then the remaining uh, 20 minutes, uh, questions and comments. Over to you, Professor Asiedu. Hi, good afternoon, everybody. And thank you so much for the kind introduction. I would like to thank you also for inviting me to participate in your um, department seminar. I appreciate that. And also thanks for making time to you know, come and listen to my presentation. I'm giving a shout to Josine. Hello, thanks for coming. So today, and can you see my screen? Yes, we can see. All right. So the title of my talk today is the relationship between income per capita and health outcomes and whether or not Africa is different. Uh, there's a large literature on the exceptionality of Africa, right? That and um, for some reason, the factors that might, many economic factors, right? The behavior of these factors in Sub-Saharan Africa is significantly different from that of the rest of the world. And the literature has included whether, for example, the determinant of FDI to Africa is different from that of the world which is you know, one of my um, papers in um, world um, development and um, several including, <laughs> um, the famous paper was, I think it was in 1997 by Bill Easterly, Easterly and Levine that argued that, you know, Africa is structurally different from the rest of the world. And that is the explanation for, you know, Africa's um, um, abysmal um, growth performance. They refer to that as Africa's growth tragedy. And it was, it ended up being very, very controversial in the profession. So in this paper, the motivation is actually derived from data, right? And I got, we started working on this because it was, we had a, it was based on a call for, um, from the um, African Development Bank. And so that, the, the, that's their flagship publication. And the point that we're making was that, you know, in the past, like, two decades, right? So from 2014 to 1994, you know, Africa did experience significant um, um, increase in growth. And they wanted to know whether the title of their um, 
the report was whether growth was um, inclusive. Okay, so I wrote up the background paper and then of looking at the data closely gave me the idea for this paper. So I must say that I have, you know, several co-authors. There's um, Nipa, is a professor at um, State University, New York at Fredonia. There's Ma Malukele Nanivazo. She's also a professor at Phillips College here in the US. Mwanza is with the IMF. Yi Jane is a professor at University of Finance and Economics in China. And then Jones Pentel. Jones is my graduate student here at Harvard. So the usual disclaimer applies. Anything positive, I take credit. Anything negative, I attribute that to my co-authors. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So what is the motivation for this paper? Again, like I mentioned, you know, Africa, similar to you know, several developing countries, generally experience extensive, you know, unprecedented increase in GDP per capita, right? And we go back to the um, seminal paper by Pritchett and Summers, right? And the title of the paper is actually healthy, um, richer countries are healthy, right? And on page 863, they know that gains from rapid economic growth flow into health gains. The paper is published in the Journal of um, Human Resources. So the question I asked was, so this was in 1996, right? So I'm looking at this same code 20 years after, right? And the question is, does this still apply? And if so, is that in terms of the um, relationship between economic growth and then health gains, is that um, relationship the same? for countries in our favorite continent. Okay. And so the question here is, did increased growth lead to an improvement in population health? And for population health, I looked at four indicators of health. Um, infant mortality and the five years mortality, life expectancy for men and women, and the question is, is the growth effects, if any, on health outcomes similar, the same for countries in Sub-Saharan Africa and outside Sub-Saharan Africa? Okay. So again, this research is motivated by the data. Okay. So if I look at GDP per capita during this period, the two decades, right? For both the mortality rates for children, it declined significantly. The same for life expectancy. In fact, if you look at life expectancy, the gains for Sub-Saharan Africa was much higher than the rest of the world. So the question then is, what is this you know, relationship? Can we... Uh, attributed to causality. So in this case, the increased growth has a causal impact on these four health outcomes. In addition to um, some, uh, some SS paper, right? I also looked at, we also looked at a paper, so but this is a very old paper, again, another seminal paper. And what Preston was claiming was that GDP per capita was not that relevant in explaining um, the improvement in health outcomes, right? And that the importance of GDP per capita has been actually been declining over time. And he suggests that in fact, at some point, GDP per capita would be completely irrelevant, okay? And so I refer to that, you know, exogenous factors. And his analysis is based on data, historical data from 1900, 1930s, and then 1960s, 
Okay. So you see that for a given level of GD, not income per head, right, in constant um, 1963 dollars, let's take 600, for example, right? This is the GDP per capita in the 1930s. No, this is their, this is their uh, life expectancy, right? So the life expectancy was a little less than maybe 48. And then in the 1930s, it went up close to about 54. And by 1960, 30 years after, so it's 30 year interval, it was up to about 67, right? So the conclusion here is that the, if the relationship, right, between GDP, in this case, for a given level of GDP, right, countries for some reason are experiencing um, gains in life expectancy, okay? So, so they, this graph tells us that, right, GDP per capita is important. However, some exogenous factors are also important. In fact, he concludes that exogenous factors accounted for about 75 to 90% of growth in life expectancy for the world as a whole between 1930s and 60s, while increasing um, income accounted for between 10 to 25%. I must say that his, um, this conclusion was just based on some kind of correlations. And I believe Preston is a sociologist. Right. He also concludes that GDP per capita has become less relevant over time, and that after a certain point, it might disappear. Okay. So, in addition to asking whether or not Sub Saharan Africa is different, and then, you know, the um, Summers um, conclusion saying that, you know, um, games in um, income spills over to gain same health outcome. I also ask the question whether or not it is the case that um, that some exogenous factors can also account for GDP per capita, right? And so my analysis again is going to be based on data from 1994 to 2014. 128 countries. So those are all the countries and developing countries, of course. And though it included all the countries for which the data uh, is available. Okay. We are trying to extend um, the data to more recent stuff, but the bank, the World Bank has stopped collecting data on some of the of the you know health outcomes. And so yeah. So again, I'm using my data to kind of replicate uh, uh, Preston, right? So this is per capita income in, um, I graph for 20 in 2011 um, constant dollars. I graph for mortality rate for 2014 and then 2011, okay. So it is true that, you know, over time, it, I mean, the higher income have, you know, a lower mortality rate, but more importantly, for a given level of income, the mortality rate has declined, right? Because this is 1995 mortality rate is higher than the 2014 mortality rate. So that's my first um, measure of population health. This is my second measure. So this is um, life expectancy. So we, okay, here. 
Okay. Did I repeat this? Okay, this is the one year mortality. Okay, this is life expectancy, right? So life expectancy is positively correlated with um, income, right? But the fact still remains that for a given level of income, the life expectancy has improved. So this is what I refer to as exogenous factors. And it, it's quite intuitive, right? So for example, if you take the uh, eradication of chicken pox, et cetera, most of them had, you know, they, um, the process was not directly related to a country's income. It was the WHO, it was the uh, private foundations, including the Gates Foundation, the Carter Foundation. They provided resources to these countries right, to help eradicate some of these diseases. In fact, some may even include malaria, right? So this does, you know, make sense. Now, going back to um, uh, SAMIS, right, that correlation between income per capita and then the health outcomes, right? We do find this correlation Right, so higher health outcomes and uh, countries have lower mortality rates one year, right? However, what we find is that, yes, the relationship is nonlinear, but it is kind of different. This is the data, this is the graph for Sub-Saharan Africa. It is concave for countries outside Sub-Saharan Africa. Yes, it is also nonlinear. It is um, negatively correlated, but it is convex. Life expectancy, the same, right? This is countries in Sub-Saharan Africa, countries outside Sub-Saharan Africa, okay? And here I'm showing two graphs. In the paper, I did show the same pattern for five-year mortality, right? Children mortality, and then also, you know, the male um, life expectancy. So what can we infer from the data, right? One is that, I would say in the paper I, I used, we use the word conjecture, right? That global factors may have a significant impact on health outcomes and that this effect has increased over time. And to test this empirically, we include a variable that captures um, time-specific events. The graphs also show that the relationship between GDP per capita and health outcomes may be quadratic, okay? So in Summers' paper, they treat GDP enters as a linear variable. They just use GDP per capita. But this graph tells us that at least the data from 20, um, nine, um, 1994 to 2014 suggests that the relationship is quadratic. And so for empirical analysis, we include the square of GDP per capita. The graph also shows that the relationship between GDP per capita and health outcomes may be different for countries in Sub-Saharan Africa and then developing countries outside Sub-Saharan Africa. And so we include a dummy variable for SSA countries, and then also the interaction chain for Sub-Saharan Africa and GDP per capita. Okay. Now, health outcomes are likely to be persistent. So that means YT, current period, is correlated with in the previous period, right? And that seems to be the case for many, many macro sequences, right? If that is the case, then the lag dependent variable, because your current period, right, depends on the previous period. So your lag dependent variable should be uh, an explanatory variable. 
that itself generates, introduces an endogeneity problem, right? Then there's also the issue of reverse causality, right? Between health outcomes and GDP, right? Several papers, I cite two of them find that lower mortality rates may have a positive impact on income per capita, and then Bloom and um, Tabatli and Sunday also find that income um, life expectancy, higher adult life expectancy may significantly um, increase income per capita, right? So that is also the issue of reverse causality. So that also is a potential endogeneity problem, right? And especially when you have the last dependent variable, you know, um, Arulano and Bond clearly show in their 1990, 1991 um, General of Econometrics paper showed that this type of endogeneity cannot be addressed by the standard procedures like two state least squares, fisc effects, et cetera. Right, because they produce inconsistent estimates, biased and inconsistent. So in 1991, right, we, you know, there was a um, empirical analysis, especially in macro, right, we all moved to using the difference GMM estimate. And then later, Arlano and Bober, you know, found that, you know, the um, systems estimator you know, is, is better. It provides a more efficient, it's a more efficient um, estimator than the difference GMM. And of course the system estimator is um, problematic because it produces too many instruments. And so what you need to do is to check, to make sure that your number of cross-sectional um, um, variables, so which is your n over the number of instruments is greater than one. Okay. And I remember um, in um, our 2011 paper uh, with, uh, with Don Lien, it's a you know, Journal of International Economics. I think we were the first to you know, introduce what we call uh, the, the instrument count. That you know, after running your regressions, you should always you know do the instrument count. Anyway, so I will not go into detail into the, the methodology. In in the 1990s, it was a big deal, but now it's almost kind of routine, right? Now, with regards to our contribution to the literature, we need to first talk about the related literature. So we found only one paper that included uh, the quadratic term, so GDP per capita square. All the, other, all the others, including Summer's paper, estimate a linear model. And clearly, the, the data suggests otherwise. Only five uh, of the 20, out of the 20 papers did take into consideration the exogenous factors, right? Included um, time dummy variables. Only four papers included a dummy variable for some Saharan Africa. Because if you don't do that, then you are assuming that, they, that, that there's no structural difference. It's, you know, the, the, the factors are the same and the data suggests otherwise. Now, clearly we find that health outcomes are persistent, but only one paper included the um, lab health as an explanatory variable to reflect the persistence of health outcome. However, he included um, the lag dependent variable, but then the estimations were based on OLS. So clearly um, the, the estimates were not consistent because he did not address the endogeneity problem. Okay. All the papers use the OLS two state least squares or random effects estimations, right? None employ a dynamic panel estimator. Now, only three papers include HIV AIDS as an explanatory variable, right? Now, controlling for HIV, 
prevalence is important because as 2005, for example, like the uh, UN UNDP report uh, claims that HIV AIDS is a global and the disease has inflicted the greatest reversal in human development in modern history, right? And so we thought it was important to, to um, control for that as well. So what we do is we include time variables to capture exogenous factors. We include a measure of HIV prevalence. We include GDP per capita and the square of GDP per capita as explanatory variables. We include sub-Saharan, a dummy variable for sub-Saharan Africa and also an interaction between um, sub-Saharan Africa and then GDP per capita. And again, this is coming from the literature that uh, find that, you know, um, Sub-Saharan Africa is different. We employ the dynamic panel system estimator, right, to address any endogeneity and dynamic issues not considered in previous literature. And the fact that the um, system GNMEM has been used in several studies. I've used it in at least two of my papers, and they are both published in the Journal of International Economics. So that this is the sample and our four measures of health outcomes. And of course, our variable of interest is GDP per capita. And these are the control variables. We tried other um, variables that had been used in previous studies, but they did not, you know, they were not significant or did not uh, display a consistent relationship. And for several of them, for example, access to safe water, the data was not really available, right? The data was available for only a few countries. And so that's why. So this is the um, equation that we estimate. So I is countries, T is time. We have our interaction term, right? Let's see, this is the interaction term. This is GDP per capita, the linear and the quadratic term. This is their intersect, the Sub-Saharan Africa dummy, right? And then this is the lag dependent variable, right? And then we have our time and country specific effect as well. So we first start by analyzing the direct effect of direct relationship between GDP per capita and then health outcomes. So in that case, right, we drop this interaction term, okay? So these are the results, and then I'm gonna show you the graph. So for the direct, the direct effect where we just, uh, estimate the more or less the equation that has been employed in several studies that we have like the, um, we include the sub-Saharan Africa dummy variable and then also the quadratic term, right? And so we find that the, so here, the lag dependent variable is significant. And so that makes a case for using the system GMM because clearly tells us that um, the um, health outcome, in this case, the under one year mortality is persistent, okay? We also find that all else equals Sub-Saharan Africa countries have a higher mortality rate and lower life expectancy than non-African countries. Uh, 
Okay, so let's go back. Let me try this non linear. Okay, so here, so you see that this is the mortality rate, all else equal, the mortality rate for Sub Saharan Africa is higher, right? So I have, I'm displaying three columns. The first column just is the lag dependent variable, my lag, the African dummy, and then my GDP variable, right? And then I add controls, even with the controls, the SSC is significant. And then also the GDP per capita is nonlinear, right? So that is then consistent with my graph that there's something different about Sub-Saharan Africa, but more also the fact that the, um, the non-linear the non relationship between GDP per capita and health outcome. So that means that a model that does not include the square GDP, right? It says uh, misspecification. Okay. The last column controls for HIV, right? Like I said, I believe only a few papers control for HIV. And that is important because once you control for HIV, the estimated coefficient of your Sub-Saharan Africa um, dummy variable shrinks, right? It goes down significantly, about 0.9 uh, percentage points. So this is the under one mortality rate. The results is qualitatively similar for the under five mortality rate. You find that again, how outcomes is persistent, GDP, they were a sub-Saharan Africa dummy variable is significant, it shrinks after you control for you know, HIV, AIDS, and again, the um, GDP per cap, income per capita, the relationship between income per capita and health capital is nonlinear. So the nonlinearity does come true. Okay. Similar for life expectancy. Okay. So all else equal, the life expectancy for Sub Saharan Africa is significantly lower than the rest of the world. But after controlling even for HIV, right? So we can say that, well, you know, the life expectancy is low because of HIV, because even after controlling for it, yes, it shrinks significantly, right? About maybe 10 percentage points, but it is still significant. It's like 6.74 percentage points lower. So the same for um, midlife expectancy. Okay, so because it's non-linear and to also to give the reader a sense of what these numbers mean, right? We take the derivative of the health outcome with respect to um, GDP per capita, right? And clearly we see that countries, you know, the higher GDP per capita, right? have benefited more. Look at the, like Romania is in the 90th percentile. It's about negative 30 percentage points decline compared to Sierra Leone, which is about 22.92. So the point is that OLC core richer countries benefit more from an increase in GDP. The same for, you know, life expectancy. The results are qualitatively um, similar, right? Richer countries benefit more. Okay, so now we look at the interaction effect, right? So this is the, the, the uh, intercept effect, now the slope effect. The interactive effect is you, you find the interaction between SSC and then the um, GDP per capita. And this is a variable of interest, right? Because it tells you the difference, right? So what this is saying is that all else equal, 
a change in GDP per capita, right? And is um, resulting in this case, let me focus on the second, right? With where we include GDP, um, we control for HIV, right? It lowers uh, the under one and under five mortality rates, right? More in, okay, more in Sub-Saharan African, other countries that in Sub-Saharan African countries, right? It doesn't, in this case, it's gonna be point, yeah, 2.56 percentage points. That's the difference. And then for life expectancy for their, uh, yeah, for the mortality rates, it's 11.28 percentage points, right? After controlling for HIV, right? So the impact is less for countries in Sub-Saharan Africa by 11.28 points. Right, and then for five year mortality rates is 0.14 percentage points less for some time, right? So, clearly, because this is significant, it tells us that sub Saharan Africa is different. This is male and female mortality rate. again. This is our focus. Okay, so the slope effect in terms of the uh, sub-Saharan Africa being different, we have the slope effect, and then we also have the, um, no, this is the slope effect, and then this is their intercept effect, right? Okay, now the last question, so we've established, right, that SSA is different that the relationship between um, income and then health outcomes is not linear and that, you know, richer countries benefit more, right? Now we go to Preston's point that the um, exogenous factors have become more important over time. So in this um, slide, I'm reporting the coefficient of the time variable, right? In each of the regressions, if you look at the paper, in each of the regressions, we have the coefficient, we report the coefficients of the time variable. But this is it. You're going to see that for the mortality rates, the size of the coefficients changes, right, over time. It gets bigger, but then bear in mind that it's negative, right? So over time, the impact of these exogenous factors is getting bigger and bigger, right? In this 1977 to 1999, it was just 2.14 percentage points. As at the last period, a whopping 17.15 percentage points. The same for five-year mortality rates, um, less than five, 3.1 percentage points to about 24.9 percentage points. And the same also holds for, you know, the um, life expectancy that the size has increased over time. So in this sense, it's consistent with um, Preston's argument, although he's, he was looking at data from the 1900s. So what is the conclusion that global factors, which you know, non-country specific factors, or have a positive and significant impact on health outcomes, uh, and that their effects have increased over time, that countries in Sub-Saharan Africa have a higher rate and lower like higher mortality rate and a lower life expectancy than countries outside the continent or else equal, that 
An increase in GDP per capita improves health outcomes. And the effect is stronger at higher levels of income. And the effect of GDP per capita on health outcomes is different for Sub-Saharan African countries. And you know, therefore, Sub-Saharan Africa is different. So that's the end of my talk. I think I'm on time. So I'll be happy to take questions. Thank you very much, Prof. Um, um, I think we can open the floor now for a few questions. Well, can I can I go first? Yeah. Um, well, first of all, thank you so much, uh, Professor for such a wonderful presentation, uh, very insightful. Um, I have I've, uh, I've learned a lot. Um, uh, I I just have one or two uh, questions. I mean, semi comments, you know, semi question. Um, you know, the first one is that. Um, uh, you know, just thinking about, you know, is Africa different? You know, um, I, I have a strong sense that, you know, um, maybe lumping, you know, Africa or African countries together in this sort of fashion also probably um, might, um, well, I, I'm not going to use the word bust the estimates, but I would say that um, would assume a lot, you know, I mean, because I think uh, presumably even uh, African countries themselves, you know, they, they are unique, you know, um, and, and what you may presumably find, you know, is that um, when you sort of start disaggregating the data, you know, um, within you know, the sub-Saharan countries for that matter, is you'll find that, you know, um, the estimates, you know, would vary uh, quite substantially. You know, um, for example, if you start, you know, um, using the World Bank classification within the sub-Saharan countries, you know, uh, the, the estimates might might sort of differ. So I think that might be interesting to, to look at as well, you know, to see uh, how different uh, uh, you know, uh, countries within, within you know, the, the continent are insofar as this relationship is concerned, you know. Um, and then uh, the other, you know, uh, not so important question, I mean, really is, is whether um, when one thinks about, you know, uh, the kind of changes you're pointing out over time, you know, that uh, if I understood you correctly, that um, what's really happening is that um, GDP per capita, you know, it used to have a bigger impact, you know, but over time, exogenous factors are actually beginning to play a bigger role, you know, um, and, and that's interesting, you know, a finding. Uh, but is it possible that, uh, for example, um, maybe the issue is structural breaks, that's what you have here, you know, it's it's not so much that GDP is playing a role less than other exogenous factors, but you know, let, let's take a global financial crisis. You know, um, that that could change the you know the relationship. It could dilute this relationship in some sense. You know, contaminate you know these these results, and and maybe that's what's going on here. Is that over time there's a lot of uh, presumably shocks, you know, that, you know, I, I presume during the shocks, you know, the GDP goes down. I mean, so then then presumably what's going on is that, you know, uh, these other factors are now appear to be playing a bigger role. But in fact, it's just, you know, it's because the economy is not doing well at that sort of time, you know, and 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 so on. And therefore, you know, you, you, you're not able to capture this kind of, uh, uh, structural break, you know, in the analysis. Anyway, I'll, I'll stop there. But thank you so much. You know, that's a great presentation and a uh, very interesting topic. Yeah. Thank you so much. Yeah, you do, you know, I, I agree with you that 
Africa within the continent, you know, we are, we are, we are diverse, right? It's not just even within the continent or even looking at West Africa, South Africa, da, 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 right? Within a country, I, I'm from Ghana, okay? So if you take like the Northern part of Ghana, I'm from the South. I don't have much in common with anybody from the Northern part of Ghana. In fact, they have a lot more in common with uh, the residents of Burkina Faso. Some of them have relatives in Burkina Faso. If you're from the Volta region, right, you have relatives in the Togo, right? They speak the same language, the same with you know, Burkina Faso and then you know, the North, yeah. And so you are right, that there's a problem with aggregation, but even at the country level, if you do a, you know, a country analysis, you are still aggregating. Now, fortunately, there's more data available, more micro data available. You no, know, 15, 20 years ago, th that was not the case, right? And so you were right. I think it would be good to have, you know, a, a less disaggregated analysis. But for me, the fact that it may be Africa is different is not necessarily a bad thing, right? I'm not coming from the Easterly and Levine side where it's like, oh yeah, they have this. Um, it's a cultural problem, and you know, the language and too many languages and that is why you know Africa is growing less. What does my take away from some of the work I've done, I just finished a work for UNUIDA and we found that when you look at um, the, um, so the, during the financial liberalization, Right, we find that the outcome of the liberalization measures that were imposed on many, many countries, most of them was part of the you know, World Bank IMF you know, policies. The outcome was not very good for, or it was different for countries in Sub-Saharan Africa. All this is saying is that you know, before one makes a policy prescription, one needs to be cognizant of the fact that some of these areas in the world may be structurally different and therefore you cannot just be policies cannot be replicated in you know just in like different regions and uh, yeah I think it would be good to so in this case like not this kind of one size fits all policy recommendations for me that's what I, I get out of it yeah but now with more data being available, I think more, I mean, there should be maybe a further analysis using more, you know, micro data. Okay. So I used to be, I would say like a macroeconomics, I was just cross country regressions, but in the past few years, you know, I'm learning to do micro work because I believe that is the, the way to go, to really get you know, a better understanding of what's on the ground. But thank you so much, Mundu. I see uh, Prof Aita's hand is up. I think you can also ask a question and then we also have a question here in the chat box. But Prof Aita, the floor is yours. Okay, I think mine is related to what was asked by Mundu. Um, because I just wanted to find out, because I think uh, when Mdu was talking about uh, putting Africa together with other countries, will it be um, probably because I'm thinking one could uh, do an estimation like what you have, what you have done now, and then uh, you can also estimate the same model in a different variation where you only have African countries. So because I thought uh, probably that could also help, then you can compare to see this is these are the results that we get when we put Africa, African countries together with ad, uh, other economies. And this these are the results that we get when we only have African countries. Will that, uh, because I thought that could, that is something that one could consider. 
Excellent. That is so true. So in this case, we are looking at explaining the variation within African countries, mm. which is good. But this is one caveat, mm. right? Supposing that you had all the African countries, let's say we're taking Sub-Saharan Africa, it's about 48. For some of the estimation procedures in particular, even if it's fake to fake, you need a large N and a large T. The systems GMM, for example, is much better because you know when your T is not too high, you are okay, but you are looking at again, the instrument ratio is N over I, the number of instruments. So when your N is not very large, it becomes a problem. Thank you. Right. So that is the, you know, one of the, um, the, the caveats, right? Yeah. It's just the, 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 the sample size and coming up with an estimation procedure that would provide consistent and reliable, you know, estimates. Thank you. I would, I would just like to read out a question, Prof, in the chat box from Marshall Makate. Uh, thank you, Prof, for a very interesting work and insight. I was wondering if you could kind of clarify what the results on interaction terms are saying. It seems to me as if the results seem to say that the mortality increases more than more in SSA with a one dollar unit increase in GDP per capita. Is that correct? Uh, slide thirty-three in particular. Yes, I think that is correct. So let me share my screen again. Give me one second. Yes, slide 33, I think. Mm -hmm. It's probably this, right? Is it the interaction? Yes, the interaction term. Uh, it says, yeah, it seemed as if the results seem to say that the mortality increases more in SSA with a $1, $1 increase in GDP per capita. Is that correct? Yes, because, okay, so let's look at the, oh no. So for a $1 increase, right, it's going to be, Whatever the increase is, is 0.11 percentage, one one, yeah, 11.28 percentage points higher in Sub-Saharan Africa than in other regions. So for example, supposing the increase is um, five percentage points, right? In Sub-Saharan Africa, it's gonna be, no. Now, suppose that the, the increase, uh, one unit increase in GDP per capita, I have to do the number. Supposing that it is like 30 percentage points reduction. In Sub-Saharan Africa, the reduction will not be 30, right? It's going to be, what's 30 minus kind of 11? Does that make sense? Because the yes. coefficient is positive. Yes, thanks, Prof. I can see in the chat box, yes, the question is answered. Um, I would just like to see if there's any more questions that you have for uh, Prof on this very interesting presentation. Just looking in to see if there's any hands still raised. Um, but I see we've just run out of time. Um, I see they're saying thank you, Prof, for this wonderful presentation. Um, I think we can now close the presentation. Um, I think... Um, we would just like to say thank you very much, Prof, for this very insightful, detailed presentation. I, I always see the, the success of a presentation is the, is the amount of people that stick around throughout the whole session. And that actually stayed already 100%. Like everybody stayed in a presentation. And that just shows um, how great this was. And we really thank you. And we are honored to have you present here in the School of Economics, EDWRG. And we hope to have you in the future also, maybe some more collaboration in the future. But thank you very much. Um, Madhu, I'm not sure if you have a few words to say. No, no, you, you've said everything. 
Thank you so much. You know, we really appreciate it and looking forward to um, future presentations. Yes, I will be happy to. And thank you so much for making time to listen to me. Thank you so much. Thank Enjoy you, the rest thank of you. Day. And thank you everyone for attending. We really appreciate it. Bye. We will keep you up to date with new presentations. Thank you very much, everyone. Have a great and awesome day further. Morning thank or you. noon or night. Thank you. Bye-bye. All right. Stop, stop. Where is the barrier?